hello and good morning. Welcome. Climate change, that's the topic. I'm going to get straight into the slides uh, very shortly. If you're wondering about the background noise, the windows are open. It's a bit of bird song, just enjoy it. A distraction from listening to me. So let's get straight into this. Thank you very much to, to everybody who's uh, registered. There's a lot of you. Uh, you've come from all sorts of places. Uh, your interests are very, very uh, varied. Uh, so we're going to try and accommodate all of those. And you've got a QA, and a so make the most of it. Uh, take advantage of Nina. Nina Pindam, my colleague in Chambers, Hello. who understands all of this, uh, which is why I've got the introduction and she's got all the really, uh, really tricky bits. So uh, send in the questions, please do. Right, where are we going to go with this? Can I make it really clear at the outset? We're not here to uh, do the talk, uh, we're all doomed. That's not our talk. Uh, those talks are out there done by people uh, who are much more knowledgeable than we are about those questions. So the climate science, uh, understanding the Paris Agreement, that's all uh, for others. We're not gonna do that. So we're gonna work on the basis that you've, you've got all of that in mind, but what we are going to do is look at the trajectory of litigation uh, around the world, around the world. And you might immediately say to yourself, well, frankly, I can manage tracking what's happening to the NPPF this week, uh, what the Lord Chancellor decided to do yesterday in terms of our court system, but keeping track of what's happening in Germany and Nepal is a bit much. Well, what we're gonna try and do is synthesize some of that uh, because uh, we think that it has a wider uh, effect, but perhaps more limited than some might say. That might be where we're going. So what we're going to do is look at that litigation, partly by reference to numbers, and then we're going to put some colour on all of that. And what we're going to do is then uh, understand how that might affect you practically. That's what we want to do. We want to look at how it might affect you practically, uh, depending on who you are, because it doesn't affect all sectors or professions in the same way. So just so that we've got the basics. What we're looking at is one and a half degrees being the increase in global temperature that leads to serious tipping. Now, that's not me trying to get into the climate science and dealing with climate change. That's a number which has now legal significance. Uh, what we're looking at is then what's necessary to achieve that objective and the cases engage with this. The cases tell us uh, a lot about climate, uh, climate science and particularly uh, the Shell case, which we'll come to later on. What we're also flagging is the interaction uh, between uh, the question of carbon and so many other matters which affect uh, you every day in what you do, uh, whether you're dealing with uh, effects upon biodiversity or any other planning or environmental matter. So that's the basic start off. So these are the things which are going to be key to the cases, principally the uh, Paris Agreement and the fact of uh, our own uh, act and the way in which it was amended by Theresa May just in the closing weeks of her premiership, uh, being much more uh, ambitious about it and looking to the future with what's going to happen in Glasgow. I'm not going to dwell on that. Just at the outset, I want you to have these uh, references in mind because uh, we're going to turn to numbers very shortly uh, with Nina's assistance. And I want to give credit, particular credit, to the Grantham Research Institute, which has produced uh, just in the last few weeks its latest uh, assessment of global trends in climate litigation. I give you the reference there and we're grateful to them for their uh, amazing work in that regard. And likewise to uh, those who do a rather similar job uh, in the States. Thank you to them. And those are the references if you need them. These slides will be distributed uh, to delegates uh, in due course uh, later on today. Uh, so you'll, you'll get this record. Uh, there's quite a lot of slides. So uh, you 
you should have most of the material in the PowerPoint. So we get to numbers. Hello everyone. Right. Um, as lawyers, we like to be precise. So we've got some precise numbers for you. Less than 2,000 cases, um, but on the precision front, um, that is 1,841 um, judged as being ongoing or concluded. Um, this is as of May 2021. Um, of those, more than half a significant percentage were American cases. That's 1,000. 387 um, of that 1800 um, were American cases. So comparatively low figures, when you think about the, the millions of uh, cases being brought across the world every year, um, but of huge, huge global significance, everybody is talking about climate litigation and everybody, every jurisdiction across the world um, is becoming subject to this and paying attention to it. And you can see the trends. Uh, the number of cases is growing, what a UNEP report last year um, described as a tidal wave, I think using the word knowingly, a tidal wave of um, litigation. And the global reach is, is expanding uh, exponentially as well. In uh, up to 2014, uh, climate litigation was uh, conducted in 12 countries. By uh, 2017, so from 2014 to 2017, that had doubled to 24 countries. And from 2017 to 2020, that reached 38. So uh, exponential growth, not only the number of cases, but also uh, in the countries and jurisdictions in which it's being brought. Uh, of these, interestingly, um, you do hear a lot about the failures, but the Grantham Institute's excellent research um, looked at whether there was a favorable outcome to this litigation. Um, and they concluded actually more cases than not were favorable. So 58% of um, these 1,841 cases were favorable to uh, climate change action. That's their um, determining factor, climate change action. 32% they concluded were unfavorable to climate change actions. That's a risk to be aware of. And 10% uh, they couldn't discern whether it was or was not favorable or unfavorable to climate change action. So actually, uh, almost 60% of these cases are successful in some way towards securing uh, favorable environmental um, action. Now, the substance of these cases, um, very, very interesting. The legal aspect, also incredibly interesting. We'll come on to that in a moment um, with the Heathrow litigation. But we'll, the trend in this litigation um, really come, comes down to the question of the courts rapidly grappling with changing social norms. And time and again, litigants are coming up against the, the question in the courts where the boundary of political decision-making ends and the law begins. And they're often um, foundering on that boundary because most of these decisions, um, as we know, are political um, and not something the courts are prepared to venture into. Again, this is something we're going to, to return to, particularly in the UK context. Um, claimants are not finding um, fertile ground for these cases. There, just quickly, the high percentage of these cases reach apex courts because, as I've just said, these are dealing with novel instances where the, the decision, the legal framework, hasn't been established. There's no precedent, um, and the courts are frankly playing catch up um, uh, with the legal framework. And there's a, a catch up amongst the two interactions of the legal framework um, and the courts are, are moving um, sometimes in tandem, uh, sometimes not um, as the litigation demonstrates. Most of these cases are brought by NGOs, but also um, individual petitioners as well. Um, and that, that, that does make sense because climate change obviously impacts absolutely everyone. So it's not only the, the interest groups that care about this, individual members of the public care, um, and they care deeply enough to put their hands in their pockets um, and, and bring a claim. So uh, very, very important, no indication at all that this trend of exponential growth in litigation is um, uh, coming to an end anytime soon. Um, the government is by far and away the main defendant in this litigation. However, the Grantham Institute does recognize a third area um, of the three main, main areas of growth that doesn't concern the government. To be comprehens comprehensive, the three main areas are firstly, government support and decision-making in relation to the fossil fuel industry. That is um, the main target um, and growth area of climate change litigation. Secondly, claims regarding the distribution of burdens um, associated with climate action, what they label, what the Grantham Institute labels the just transition cases. And Richard 
is going to touch on those um, in a moment. But the third area, which doesn't concern the government, is value chain litigation. Um, we've heard of corporations being subject to claims relating to um, corporate disclosure and CSR, ESG, environmental social government, corporate social responsibility um, obligations, but also their value chain um, uh, is subject to litigation as well, and that is an increasing growth area. So lots of growth, lots of areas of challenge. Um, government is a, on notice, but so too should be corporations and private interests. Um, and then next slide, please. Um, may contain nuts. Um, this is the caveat in everything that I've just said, which is that it is quite hard, um, as with anything, um, the numbers depend on how you define the category. Um, so the abs actual number of cases um, that qualifies climate change litigation in every report that considers um, the impact, the trends, the strategy of climate change litigation all has this um, uh, caveat, which is we've defined it this way. You could define it else, uh, another way. Um, and this is increasingly going to be the case because climate change adaptation and mitigation in particular is going to impact absolutely every aspect of um, human life lives practically. Um, so litigation could be considered climate change litigation, even though it has absolutely nothing to do um, with CO2 whatsoever, um, but perhaps flooding, for example, um, or insurance risk um, and uh, disclosure, et cetera, et cetera. All sorts of areas of law and um, being subject to what could be described as climate litigation. And we've got a figure on the next slide just to show in beautiful pictorial form, exactly what um, uh, this tidal wave uh, looks like when you've analyzed it properly. Um, we don't have the time. This is an incredibly useful report um, published by um, Setzer and Higgum at the um, Grantham Institute, also the LSC. Um, uh, it's a joint research um, project and they've analyzed all of the climate litigation that I've just summarized um, and uh, boiled it down to this very beautiful graph that shows um, just how much um, this is taking off internationally. And I think we're well, moving back to Richard now, who's going to help us find some focus within all of this um, uh, tidal wave of litigation. I quite like the, the next slide, please. It's, it's <laughs> Professor Pinder, <laughs> Professor Pinder. <laughs> next slide, please. Which of course makes me Boris. Um, there we go. Um, finding focus, what am I talking about here? What we need to do is understand what these cases are, because then we can understand whether they bother us. Are we interested? Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference to me? And it's what lawyers do. They, they like to classify things and sort them out. Sometimes they, they uh, rather overplay that. Uh, but what we can do is say that some of these things are uh, in particular categories. Uh, and some of them are set out on this slide. And if you are a government, you're going to be particularly concerned with the public law claims. Uh, if you are a government body, a decision maker, likewise, you're going to be particularly concerned with the public law claims. And you can see uh, from the nature of the organizations bringing the litigation, that many of them come from a public law background and it's not surprising that it's to that particular jurisdiction that they go at the outset. So we're going to have quite a lot to say about uh, the way in which public law claims uh, might affect you, whether you are the government, whether you're a decision maker, whether you are going to get a decision uh, which is lawful, challengeable. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to say rather less about the contractual breaches and indeed about the commercial aspects, largely because of the limits of time and because you've been so good in registering, uh, in indicating what your interests are. Uh, and so we've had regard to that in the balance of material that we're presenting. So that's, that's a split, that's a classification. Um, let's then think a little bit further about trying to find order, um, thinking about targets because th there is a phrase here, strategic litigation. Uh, and uh, in climate litigation now, uh, we, we have a whole series of strategic litigators. We've always had strategic litigators, it's not new. 
Uh, there's been strategic environmental litigation all the time I've been in practice. Uh, all that it's uh, about is a collateral uh, reason uh, for bringing the claim or uh, a straight upfront challenge to the uh, uh, whole edifice of a particular way uh, of setting up uh, the, the policy in the, in the particular state or setting up the, the legal framework. And in this category, in the strategic litigation uh, uh, category, you get both sorts. And we're gonna deal with, and we've got some flesh on those bones by reference to those big claims that you'll have all heard about. But the causes of action are many and various. So that's why we say may contain nuts. You know, uh, what is a climate change case? Uh, it's a case about the climate which is a great piece of recursive definition. But what I'm trying to get at is that uh, some of the successful cases that, uh, have been in tort, common law or uh, in civil law jurisdictions uh, by reference to their own particular codes. See again, the Shell case. But we can also look at what the remedy is. What are you trying to get the court to say? Uh, and in some cases, uh, Government bodies and others have been compelled to do things. In others, it's about damages. And both are prevalent. Both are prevalent in the case law. From uh, our point of view, uh, having regard to who I know is registered for this webinar, webinar you're particularly interested in remedy. What, what happens if there's a case uh, which involves climate change? And this is a very, very live topic because yesterday the Lord Chancellor published uh, his JR uh, reform bill and a, a very important section of that is all about remedy it's all about what you get if you win uh, and the objective of that uh, draft legislation uh, is to introduce flexibility some would say to reduce the uh, extent of the remedy available so there's there's a, some toing and froing going on here some tension uh, in, the, in in our domestic courts uh, and between the domestic courts and, and the government as to, as to what happens if there is uh, a legal error. And this is going to play out in respect of uh, this type of litigation as much as any other. So order uh, and uh, some uh, examples. Uh, let's deal with government first of all. Many of you will know the facts of the first key uh, Dutch case, a bit of a dynamo, the Dutch dynamo of uh, climate litigation. Uh, the Hague courts have been uh, very uh, active. At first instance, not, not big important courts, uh, the apex courts, uh, very active. Uh, in this particular case, in the agenda case, that what you see there, putting together what we've already been touching on, is an attack on what the government's plan was. What was said to the Dutch government was, what you're doing is not enough. And it's unfair. It's unfair to those coming later. It's unfair to young people. Uh, it's contrary, what's being relied upon uh, is uh, rights under Article 2 and 8, life, family life, uh, human rights based claim succeeded. Very important case. Many of you will know about that. Likewise, the Colombian case, different angle, uh, stopping deforestation. Again, uh, rights based, but uh, also uh, strongly founded in the Paris Agreement. So it, in it, this is important. It's an international agreement which is playing out around the world in domestic courts uh, and having a particular effect on how those courts decide these cases. And uh, the, the German case uh, is, is extremely uh, important. And I just want to uh, have a look at this in a bit more detail. Again, it, it's about uh, young people, uh, again founded in the Paris Agreement, which is uh, looking to keep um, increasing global temperatures well below two, two degrees. And uh, 
the, the essential point in this very uh, long, detailed, excellent judgment, in respect of some other cases, I'm going to uh, canvas the other view. Some of the judgments in climate change litigation are not, in my view, excellent. This is an excellent judgment, well, well reasoned, well argued, uh, founded in law, which you might expect, uh, might you? Uh, and what the, what the essentially the Constitutional Court was saying is that you have uh, this Climate Change Act, uh, abbreviating the German to KSG. That act, the KSG, doesn't do the trick quickly enough, again, shifting the burden further down the line, unfairly affecting future generations. So future generations uh, is a theme. Of course, uh, within the English and Welsh jurisdiction, that's not something that's unfamiliar to us. If you're in Wales, you've got a whole act that deals with it. Uh, and in that regard, you might think that, that that devolved administration is way ahead of what's happening in England. So uh, future generations obligations playing out uh, here in respect of what's happening in Germany. So overall, what you're seeing is the ability of a court to change what a government does. Will this happen in the UK? I'm going to deal with that shortly. But let's just move to Nepal. Extraordinary case. I'm going to deal with it quickly, but it is extraordinary. Uh, the claimant here is an advocate. Uh, the claimant uh, essentially said similar things to what was said in the German case. Uh, and when he lodged his claim, the government couldn't be bothered to respond. And so he just won by default, really. And then uh, the government woke up and think, ah, this is a problem. We've just been told to rearrange the entire way we organize our country. And so off it went to the Chief Justice and the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court agreed with the judgment below. It's an extraordinary decision. Uh, it was even more extraordinary because in terms of remedy, what that court said was, look, uh, it's going to take you a while to sort out uh, the legal framework to deal with this, uh, but you've got some policies which look quite good. Uh, they can, in effect, be law until you sort it out properly. But it's an extraordinary intervention. And one of the reasons that uh, I highlight that is just to say this in respect of England and Wales. It's, it's not the theme in England and Wales. It's not the theme. Take uh, the Heathrow litigation. Uh, the claimants uh, succeeded um, in, the, uh, in the High Court. Um, a particular view was taken in the Court of Appeal as to the materiality of the Paris Agreement. That was reversed in the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court here has said the public law approach to dealing with material considerations is, is quite narrow. It's quite a narrow approach to whether or not you have to take account of the Paris Agreement. And that's extremely important to everybody on this webinar because it tells you whether or not there is a legal error in deciding that you're not going to take account of the Paris Agreement in a decision where climate is relevant. You don't have to do it. There won't be a ground upon which you can succeed in quashing a decision if a decision maker decides not to take account of it. So it's a different story here in respect of Heathrow. Nina. Now, uh, Richard's kindly um, given me in this list one of my own cases, so if I don't really? say much, um, that would be why. Um, so the first one, not my case, HJ Banks & Co. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly because the middle case is absolutely fascinating. Um, but HJ Banks, this is an example of um, uh, policy being approached um, by the courts here um, in a precautionary way, um, but effectively, um, the consideration is not the content of the policy, that the crux was how, in a very conservative way, as our courts always approach um, questions of public law litigation conservatively, 
um, how the decision making process approached that policy. So um, uh, unlike in the Nepalese case where you get the court saying um, policy should be law, go ahead and um, treat it as such, you, you frankly would never in a million years um, expect to see that sort of remedy being ordered um, here, particularly not uh, if the latest proposals for judicial review um, are uh, brought into law. Um, Australia, the Whitehaven mine case. This is absolutely fascinating. And I think it would fall within um, one of Richard's excellent cases category. Um, it is extremely lengthy, um, a, a decision at paragraph 490, which is not even um, near the end of the decision, but at 490, um, and I believe this is the correct styling for an Australian judge, Judge uh, Bromberg, um, being Australian known as Morty, um, decided the question of whether uh, the Minister of the Environment owed children a duty of care when approving a coal mine. This is a May 2021 decision, so relatively recent. And um, Judge Morty Bromberg decided at paragraph 490 that the Minister of Mar Environment did owe a duty of care to children um, when a, a considering approving a coal mine. And this is his wording exactly, by reference to contemporary social conditions and community standards. So this is an example of the courts I indicated earlier playing um, maybe in optimistically catch up um, with policy and, and contemporary social uh, conditions and um, community standards. So really interesting decision there. Um, and, an example of uh, what happens in quite a lot of the cases where you get the strategic win, but the substantive win, not at all. Um, so what the claimants asked for here was an injunction concerning the um, coal mine decision, but that was refused by Judge Bromberg because um, the plaintiffs hadn't actually um, demonstrated that the minister, um, uh, a reasonable minister wouldn't have um, borne children in mind when, and again, this is his language, when facilitating um, the emissions of 100 megatons of CO2 into the Earth's atmosphere. So the judge gave, giving a very strong steer implicitly to the minister that they, um, they ought to uh, bear children in mind when facilitating uh, such uh, an environmental effect. Um, but as I said, in the end, that injunction wasn't granted. Final case there, this is um, one I'm instructed in on behalf of the excellent uh, Friends of the Earth, if I do say so uh, myself. Um, I know some of them are watching, um, but I would have said it anyway. They, this is a case concerning EIA. Um, so the complaint there, this is a uh, consent granted by Surrey County Council for um, fossil fuel extraction to take place over the next uh, 25 year time frame, 20 year time frame for extraction. And the complaint there, um, we had a first instance decision before Mr. Justice Holgate where he refused this argument, um, but the, um, uh, where he refused the argument that in the environmental statement, um, the County Council is required to take into account the uh, scope three emissions um, of the combustion. So the downstream combustion of the oil and gas that would be um, extracted from that mine, it being common ground amongst all the parties that the ultimate destination for that, um, those fossil fuels was going to be transport and home heating um, and, and therefore uncontrolled in terms of their emissions. And um, they weren't going to be capped um, specifically like a refinery, for example. Um, or an industrial plant. That it has been granted uh, permission to appeal by the Court of Appeal. And what I can say is that that will be heard in November. So all eyes on that uh, very interesting decision um, to come no doubt there. And I believe I'm passing back to Richard for the last of these three slides, um, other development decision. Before turning to that and uh, excusing the extraneous noise, um, there aren't any questions yet. And I think that's a matter of complaint. Uh, and so um, I would encourage you ask questions. Uh, that's what uh, Mina's here for, to answer the questions. I'm not going to say very much about the Australian case. It's just an example of a, a really, really bad attempt to rely upon climate change. It's an example uh, of uh, an Australian judge uh, using words such as old, novel, uh, and uh, surprising in respect of the way that the claim was put. And so it, while we've been looking earlier on at the numbers, we've, we've looked already at some of the really 
crucial decisions, small in number, but huge in effects. There's, there's quite a lot of the climate litigation that's out there. You look at it and you think, this isn't, this isn't great. It's not really well done. Um, um, I can probably safely say so. Uh, it was a while ago. It's not in this jurisdiction. I didn't think it was terribly well done. I want to say something about development decisions and forward planning in the context of what's going on in England at the moment. So uh, around about this time last year, some of us were appearing on what I refer to as SODC TV. It was the first uh, examination in public, uh, which was undertaken uh, virtually. And um, I, I say nothing about the merits uh, of that. Um, what I, I do want to emphasize is that uh, there was a claim uh, brought uh, under section 113 challenging uh, the adoption of that local plan. And there was a uh, ground brought by uh, essentially some of the councillors of South Oxfordshire who uh, were uh, elected very much on a uh, pro-climate basis. That's really what brought about that whole extraordinary episode in South Oxfordshire. So one of their grounds was, look, the inspector uh, didn't consider enough what the government's net zero target would mean by reference to the housing numbers. That got nowhere. Uh, it didn't get anywhere uh, on the papers uh, because you need permission for a 113. Uh, didn't get anywhere uh, on uh, renewal. So these things are, are starting to crop up. We're going to see some more of them. But to date, uh, local success uh, in, in that regard uh, is, is thin on the ground. So that's just what's happening locally. Now, I'm not gonna say an awful lot about this. What I am going to draw attention to though is that the international reach of these cases. This, this is a, apparently a French case, uh, but it's not concerned at all with what's happening in France. This is a supply chain case that the case brought is uh, in France, there is a duty uh, upon uh, undertakings, businesses, to be vigilant about uh, their operations and their effects. It's, it's a kind of duty of care. And the central point was, you're selling uh, beef from South America, uh, that beef uh, is produced uh, solely relying upon the uh, cutting down of rainforest. Uh, that harm uh, is uh, not justified uh, and you shouldn't be buying your beef uh, from suppliers who are doing that. That's, that's the argument. Not a case which is decided yet, but you can see the, 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 the central point is you can see the reach, can't you? an operation in Europe uh, in litigation as a result of what its supply chain is doing elsewhere in the world. And it's climate litigation because of the, the, the strong, indeed inevitable, interaction between on the one hand biodiversity and climate on the other, which is a point people are gradually uh, grasping. Uh, the other one, uh, the other area, just to highlight briefly, is the, uh, essentially fibbing about how green your organisation is. Um, a lot of that going on uh, in uh, Europe and elsewhere, and quite a lot of cases about it. Now, hats. I said right at the outset that what we need to do is to understand how this is going to affect us, and it depends really on who you are. And so we need some hats. Bear with me. You might think it's too hot for hats, a reason to contemplate hats, but no, that's not correct. Now, I may well be world king, but I have a government to run. So that sort of hat, you can be a government. Alternatively, 
You may wish to protest. You may be an activist. The government says activist lawyers don't exist. Climate change litigation is fundamentally driven by those who are activists. And decision makers, decision makers don't wear hats. You'll be pleased uh, to, to know, not in this uh, location anyway. So hats, what difference does it make to you? Well, let's, let's look at uh, these uh, different organizations. What I want to do is to really focus on those three. I'm not ignoring uh, corporate bodies, but it's not your focus. I've looked carefully at the attendance list, so I'm not going to spend uh, a large amount of time on that. I'm going to deal with the Boris problem first. Look at this. We, what do we have? We've got a uh, claimant in uh, the middle. So here we go. We've got our claimant here. Okay. The, the claimant uh, is uh, somebody uh, who uh, is in uh, the UK, principally uh, interested in changing this. They really want the policy to change. Uh, they uh, will really want to attack, so far as individual decisions are concerned, infrastructure, and that's a broad term I'm going to use here, particularly in respect to energy infrastructure. They will want to attack that. What we, what we really need to to, to do is to uh, understand where in England and Wales, those uh, particular aspects of government action uh, might be affected. So energy in particular, broad policy. The scope to do this is rather more limited in the UK. It's not, in my view, anything like anything like uh, the situation in Germany uh, or the situation which I referred to in Nepal. And that's why we included those at the outset. Uh, in any event, it does seem to me that we have in place climate targets, uh, which are in any event uh, ambitious. And by ambitious, I mean that they are plainly very difficult to achieve as part of the problem. So these, I think, are the main targets, policy and infrastructure. Uh, and there is a, just uh, to flag this aspect here, I put it in a dotted line because we do have hybrid bills. And I think in particular of HS2, which has its own focus. So uh, there is an interaction there between what's happening in Parliament and what government policy uh, is. Just so that it's clear, the claimant here is, is may well be an NGO, may well be some other representative body. So that the challenge to uh, HS2 was by representative body, Buckinghamshire primarily, or by an individual. Let's look at this uh, uh, in some rather uh, uh, more structured way. Um, what I want to flag to you by these four bullet points uh, is. Look, we've already got a, a parliament which is strongly engaged. See what uh, happened at the, in the dying days of Theresa May's premiership. Um, we've got separation of powers, which is uh, our own particular constitutional makeup. It is not Germany. Uh, we also have, which I've already alluded to, and we saw yesterday, uh, a particular tension between the courts and uh, the executive. Uh, and it's for that reason that the Lord Chancellor uh, didn't follow his independent panel uh, and is kicking off in the autumn with a, a bill about the extent of remedy and access to public law uh, jurisdiction. So it does seem to me that many of the ways in which the cases have been put in the Dutch and the Australian context don't translate well to the UK. Now, um, I'm just going to read a chat comment uh, because um, it's a very interesting one. Uh, those who are involved in the, in the Heathrow uh, litigation uh, 
would suggest that the Supreme Court did not say that uh, Paris was not obviously material, uh, rather to the extent that the government needed to take account of Paris, uh, they'd done that at the time because of the carbon uh, budget. Um, now, I think that uh, for my own part, I'm, I'm able to agree with, with that, um, that, but what I would point out in respect of the, the Heathrow litigation is that the central part of the decision is, is applying some rather uh, aged uh, law from New Zealand, in fact. So the whole decision in the Heathrow case was based on a case called Creed NZ. And Creed NZ said, there's a category of material consideration which you have to take into account and anything else is up to the uh, particular decision maker. And that's really what the, the central point of that case was about. But uh, I do accept that, of course, the question of carbon budgets was already factored in uh, in the decision making. It's really just a question about the status of Paris and that the status of the Paris Agreement in, in, in the UK as a material consideration, I think, is, is somewhat different now in England and Wales compared to elsewhere. Uh, and um, for those uh, I'm picking up on another question in the chat, uh, what well, it's already been dealt with. HRA is the Human Rights Act. There we go. So what we are seeing here, we see the reference to Creed and Z. We, we're seeing things uh, moving as between one country and another and an influence. And that's really quite an important feature of what's happening at the moment. And uh, it, to the extent that uh, it's demonstrable uh, uh, statistically, that's what the first bullet point is about. That the, the interaction between different courts is demonstrable. So what we get in this last bullet point is influence. And this is how this is going to affect you, whether particularly if you're a decision maker. If you've got cases going on in, say, Germany, which say you're not doing enough and you have to do it quicker, that's going necessarily going to, that's going to play out in Glasgow, isn't it? That's going to uh, affect international agreements, that's going to be transposed into national policy and then into legislation. So while it's happening in Germany, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact here. In my view, it will. So let's then turn to the decision maker. And what we're going to do now is start to really focus in on what the effects are, if you're having to make decisions or if you want a decision to be made. What's that going to do? And we're going to turn in particular to your interests in environmental assessment. That's where we're going next. So, decision maker. Thank you. Now, this is a beautiful slide and I've lost my notes on it um, because it's so gorgeous. I've, I've distracted myself. Um, if you are the decision maker here, where is your focus? Where does this, um, where are the crunch points um, for you? Uh, you might think international agreements, they are the most prominent um, and uh, one would think globally crunchy um, sources of law. No. Um, as we've seen with the Heathrow litigation, as Richard explained, um, it, the status of those um, agreements uh, are only really brought into law through their translation. Um, and as the Supreme Court found, they'd been translated. So that was uh, sufficient um, for their purposes. Um, it wasn't unlawful not to expressly um, deal with it in the way the claimants contended, uh, the Paris Agreement being it. Um, statutory climate targets. Now, one would obviously think if we've got a statutory climate target, surely that's the focus um, for litigation. Uh, again, not so. We've got policy um, and political decisions which lead us to those statutory climate targets. So as yet, um, and I say as yet, they have not been subject of um, any successful litigation in um, the courts of England, Wales, and Scotland. Other countries, yes, there's a very interesting Irish case that, um, where um, the Irish Supreme Court said actually, um, because it is a matter of law, whether you plan properly to achieve these long-term targets, you also need to plan in the short term um, uh, to have an effective short-term plan and um, to meet these long-term statutory requirements. Um, and they, the Supreme Court held, um, in his language, I believe, Justice Dolan, 
uh, what's on the statutory team is a matter for me. It's my court, my jurisdiction, my decision, and you haven't done it. Um, Government of Ireland, therefore, go back to the drawing board and, and draft different plans. Something um, the Irish courts are comfortable with, um, I would suggest the English courts, uh, English and Welsh courts, probably not. Um, so policy, and again, um, this comes down to a matter of judgment and it's extremely difficult to hang a legal hook um, in terms of uh, illegality in relation to policy. We do have um, a potential legal hook through section 38.6 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act, which is of course the, the statutory obligation to um, determine planning applications in accordance with the development plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Um, and then there's also um, plan making, there's an obligation to take into account sustainable development and whether that um, the plan achieves that. Again, um, that has been the subject of legal submissions. I believe Client Earth is particularly active in this respect, going up and down the country at local plan examinations, uh, virtually nowadays, um, saying, um, pointing out to local planning authorities this specific duty um, uh, that's on them when drafting their plan um, to, to effect. Um, they've been successful in that respect. Um, environmental regulations and biodiversity um, habitat structure in particular, although slightly vulnerable at the moment, given the proposals for the environment bill, um, those to date have been effective. Um, and then of course, at the end of the day, um, by 31st of October, 2022, at the latest, um, this is set out in statute, we will have um, environmental targets, lo binding long-term targets set out in the environment bill and they are going to be enforced by the OEP, the Office for Environmental Protection. Um, and as well as Parliament, there's an interesting accountability mechanism built into the Environment Bill. Um, uh, the compliance regime um, is really built on shame there. So um, ministers and the Secretary of State um, have to pay attention to principles and um, uh, environmental um, uh, objectives, but um, at the end of the day, uh, enforcement and compliance um, with the uh, targets until the, the long term stop date on the target is going to be through annual accountability in Parliament. So it'd be really interesting to see actually how that plays out in um, actual decision making, but um, certainly in terms of um, our daily lives as planners and environmental lawyers, we will see targets um, within all of this framework being in uh, my strong view, the most important and influential aspect of all of this um, legal framework. So keep an eye on the targets. I know they're being um, uh, consulted on um, in small groups at the moment. DEFRA has an excellent team, I have to say, working on them. Um, and we're going to see draft targets um, very shortly from my, my understanding, but in any event, um, we will have them, um, like I said, by autumn next year. Uh, now, the next um, slide, I believe I'm passing back to Richard because he can read his writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see, we'll see. Right, now, I said I'd come to this. Um, what is the purpose of strategic litigation and does it always work? <clears throat> what we're seeing is this. Uh, the objective is to, in part, to put pressure on a particular decision maker or a government uh, with a view to having an impact either on changing the policy or the weight that's given to it. And that affects everybody because it raises profile, it raises profile. And the likelihood is that the weight given to policy, which is relevant to climate change, is going to go up. But such strategies can backfire. I've already referred to uh, the status of Paris uh, agreement. That's what the last backfire remark is about. So for the decision maker, and for those who want a decision out of a decision maker, it seems to me that the extent of the direct impact is more limited in the UK. But the indirect impact is, however, very clear. At this point, what I want to do is, is run a little poll, because we're going to turn then to EIA uh, very shortly. But what I want to do is just run this poll to see, see what you think. I, I want to know what you think, having heard what you've heard and having regard to your experience, because you're a diverse lot. Um, what do you think about this? 
the main change, the main effect of climate change on your work. I'd be really interested to, to see how this, how this works out. So there's only one poll gonna happen in this webinar and this is it. What would be really good to know is what you think the effect is for you. It may be two tenths of nothing, but uh, do you think that it's really litigation, the first one, that's gonna affect your client, perhaps it's a local authority, perhaps it's a house builder, uh, perhaps it's the government. Or there's gonna be a focus on policy, shifting policy as a result of this litigation. Or do you think it's going to be an effect where you're going to be affected on how lawfully you go about assessing and reducing the effects of climate change, adaptation? How do you, how, if you want to promote a development, how do you go about assessing that? Where do you think this focus lies? I'm really grateful for all of those uh, responses. Um, I'm going to end the poll now, three, two, one. Hang on, there we go. And I'm gonna share the results. And this is what you thought. Um, clear winner, the middle one. It doesn't surprise me that relatively few consider that litigation is going to affect you directly. But that, that's, if you think about the cases, if you're the government, you're going to be ticking that box. Uh, if you're a decision maker, if you want a decision, you're going to be particularly interested in the policy. Uh, but there's probably some overlap. It may, may be an attention for you deciding uh, whether to vote for the second or third. Both might affect you. So thank you. It's a really interesting outcome. Thank you for that. And it's, it's a good cross-section of people uh, that, that uh, provided that to us. So let's move on. EIA. We, we've heard from Nina about Finch and th there have been one or two other cases about this question of, well, we're assessing greenhouse gas emissions. What about the people who use the kit that we make or the product that we sell? Do we take account of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that? And uh, in the UK, the answer to that has generally been no, but only really at a permission stage. There isn't a decided case which says it. I did one at a permission stage for the government, which for which the answer in, on that question was no, but Finch will tell us more about it. What are you talking about in terms of scope three? What scope three? So there is this case called uh, Milieu Defence, which is uh, the Dutch shell case you'll have seen all over the media. It's been hailed as an amazing case uh, and a, a historic uh, victory uh, for uh, climate change activists again in Holland, that Hague court again being busy. So um, these are my views about the case. Uh, I think that, that if you read the judgment, it has a fantastic review of what uh, climate change risks are, a fantastic review of what the obligations are internationally. And then uh, it jumps into a bit of Dutch law that has, it, it's, it really is called an unwritten law, which they've written down. There you go. Um, and they decide actually Shell has a duty to deal with the emissions uh, produced by those who are using their products. And frankly, the level of legal analysis and the authority in support of it uh, is thin. That's my view. So not all climate litigation is of the same quality in terms of the legal analysis. No doubt, very important impacts you've seen all over the papers uh, and uh, it will have its influence. Whether there's any law in there that others can rely on is another question. So scope three, scope three in the Shell case means it's in. So if you're assessing impacts of, of your uh, activity or your development, you need to be assessing the, the downstream impacts uh, of the people living in the houses you're building. That's what it means, if that's right. So let's have a look at whether that is right at the moment. So if you're doing uh, environmental assessment, of 
whatever proposal, be it infrastructure, housing, whatever it is, change of use. What at the moment what we're going to do is just look at this from the point of view of uh, what we've got at the moment. Ignore Brexit, it's all retained EU law. What we have is one, you've got uh, the directive telling us, and so all of the law behind it, which is retained EU law, telling us you've got to assess the impacts on climate and vulnerability from change. Uh, the annexes which tell us what you have to do tell us that you have to look at those things. And so uh, you, you have to assess likely a significant effect. The issue then is what do you do? Uh, and let's remember what EIA is. It's, it's not an obligation to assess everything. It's an obligation to assess those things which are likely to have a significant effect, not every effect. And what's it for? EIA is meant to be a, a, an aid to decision-making in major projects. That's all it is. It's an aid to decision-making. It's a really important aid to decision-making, uh, which I hope we continue to keep in both uh, SEA uh, and EIA, uh, whatever the government decides to do in terms of reform. Uh, there's a lot to be said in terms of process and making the process easier, but the value of the activity uh, is uh, unquestionable. But it shouldn't be overplayed and shouldn't be gold-plated. Uh, because all that we're trying to do is make a reasoned conclusion. And sometimes you, you, you think, I'm being asked to do something I just can't do. And the Act gives you the answer to that. You, you don't have to assess things which you can't assess. That might sound rather odd. But sometimes you are asked to do things to a level of precision which can't be done. And you shouldn't try to do it because uh, it's the law that you have to take account of current knowledge and methods of assessment and do that. It also, the flip side of that, and it's what Nina and I argued in the challenge to the NPPF uh, successfully, where somebody says, oh, uh, this is I can't make any assessment of this at all, that doesn't mean you do nothing. It means that you assess it to the extent that you can. You, it may be broad brush. Uh, it may be at a high level. It may not uh, result in a, a numerical model. Beware of the tyranny of numerical models and the desire for absolute precision in respect of everything, uh, which is probably not warranted in any event by the underlying assumptions. So really be careful of uh, worst cases. You might want to have regard to what the realistic central case is going to be, always taking into account uh, worst case effects, but not uh, being driven uh, by them. So exercise judgment in respect of what you take into account uh, in greenhouse gas emissions chapters. Uh, it's not a get out clause to do nothing and don't be pushed uh, to try and do that which really isn't possible. Uh, I'm going to pause shortly because Nina will have some wisdom in this regard, I'm sure. Uh, I think that uh, baseline is, is a really tricky feature. If you've looked at, if we looked at the cases that, uh, that have been litigated, um, where do you start? It's, it's not straightforward, is it? Um, particularly in a case where your housing development is needed. So there is a policy and evidential support uh, for the housing in the district. The question you're dealing with is where? Doesn't that prompt a question? Well, why does it really matter? Uh, 200 dwellings here or 200 dwellings there, the construction impacts are rather similar uh, and the way that they're operated would be rather similar. So uh, don't end up being process driven to assessing things, the answer to which isn't really going to help you. It's going to put you back into the same position. And I suspect that in that regard, that Nina will say something about scoping, at least. 
I will. We've got um, no time, uh, but I did want to address Sarah's question because you very kindly um, posed it and been sitting patiently, Sarah. So um, the easy answer is... Um, uh, What's the question? Well, that's a very good question. Um, the question for, of the question is whether there is uh, an adopted local plan. I can never tell with Zoom who's seen what and who. Uh, you think by now I've worked it out, but um, no, in q no, you can't. Um, so where a local authority has an adopted local plan, um, subsequently members take an interest. Um, I'm thinking probably you're envisaging de declaration of a climate change emergency. There are some NGOs doing interesting work on this. Um, Environmental Law Foundation, UKLA, keep your eye out for that. Um, they're studying the effect of these declarations um, as a side note. Um, are there any methods by which a local authority could incorporate climate change considerations into its decision making? Answer, yes, this has been litigated. You wouldn't be surprised to know. Um, climate change is um, a material consideration. That's a decision. Um, it was a neighbor dispute, if I recollect correctly, um, concerning solar panels and the neighbor didn't want um, solar panels, but the judge went further and said, uh, undoubtedly climate change is a material consideration. So expect that decision to be um, cropping up time and time again. Um, now, in relation to environmental effects, um, we go on for all day, frankly, for this. Um, and uh, if you have all day, um, uh, just a, a flag, speaking of hats, um, I'm also, uh, I wear a hat um, under the United Kingdom Environmental Law Association. Um, I'm one of the vice chairs and we are holding an event um, on climate change and COP26 specifically um, this autumn, you wouldn't be surprised to hear. So keep your eye on the UKLA website for that if you are interested in this area of law, which you probably um, will continue to be, um, it's not going anywhere. And I hope we've only whetted your appetite um, for more discussion on climate change litigation. Certainly it's going to be affecting all of us more and more as um, time goes on. So keep your eyes open for um, uh, events on that. Uh, mm. And we don't have time for this, I'm afraid. That's all right. <laughs> the, uh, I said that we would say very little about the commercial aspects. They overlap with that, which we've already said, but just be careful about what you wish for. Uh, Shell, in the milieu of defense case, had its own policies cited back to it. So if you're involved in setting out what you're going to do about climate change, perhaps greenwashing, don't be surprised if it comes back to haunt you. That shouldn't, of course, limit your ambition, but you need to think about whether or not you can actually do it. So we've had fun preparing this for you. We hope that you've had uh, some fun during the course of it, and uh, it's a heavy topic. We hope that the notes help. You'll get them later. If anything arises from any of those uh, slides, uh, if you want to ask us, you know where to find us. It's The email addresses are there. And as I say, Nina will answer all, all of the questions. Uh, there's a feedback form. Uh, do fill that in. Uh, any ideas on uh, future ways to take this uh, uh, or smaller uh, seminars of this of this type just say we'd be very happy to to help out with that which brings us to a close it's been a complete pleasure to do this with you with uh, Nina's expertise uh, thank you very much indeed have a pleasant day goodbye thank you everyone <laughs>